Yes, so, so my name is Marcos. I'm an associate partner in the Singapore team, um, a part of the Southeast Asia uh, operations overall. Um, I've been with Antla for three and a half years, um, already have invested in more than 100 companies here in Southeast Asia. We've also had lots of Web3 teams that uh, we will show a bit later in this presentation. Prior to Antler as part of uh, Rocket Internet uh, in Solora Group to start with later on in the corporate development role in, in Global Fashion Group, uh, been in Southeast Asia for 10 years and uh, originally from Switzerland. I'll hand it over to you, Nitin, for the first part. Thanks, Marcus. Hi, everyone. Uh, great to see you all. Um, we did an NFT one last year and asked people where they were from. And uh, I think there were people from some 30 countries and a lot of people actually just said they were from the metaverse. So it was already beginning to happen last year, but uh, please do share uh, where you're from. And uh, I would love to also get a sense of how many folks in the audience are founders um, and, and uh, or, or specifically if you're already building something in Web3 or you're interested and very early in the journey uh, or if you're a well-wisher of Antler, uh, usually a lot of our, our friends and limited partners, backers also join this call. So welcome everyone. Um, as Marcus said, uh, uh, I am uh, a partner at Antler. Uh, I happen to be heading the Web3 initiative right now. That is partly because before I joined Antler for the last few years, I've been fairly active in the Web3 and crypto scene uh, emerging out of India, but taking a very global view and um, did a number of investments uh, since 2017. So I think uh, we're, we're really, uh, at a juncture now where Web3 is becoming an extremely important uh, part of what Antler does. I think all of you are familiar, we are the world's largest venture builder. We see something like 50,000 applications from new founders every year. And we're seeing that something like 15 to 20%, if not more, of people reaching out are in, in across all geographies are beginning to uh, be focused on Web3. And that's not a surprise to, to those of us who've been waiting for this to happen. And uh, so we asked ourselves, uh, you know, what, what role does Antler have to play? We'll talk a little bit about that. So we'll, this presentation will go into three parts. Since a lot of you are still new to Web3, and there's a lot of jargon being thrown. Marcus, you could move to the next slide. Um, there's a lot of uh, jargon being thrown around. So we'll spend the first few 10, 15 minutes on sort of just sharing with you how we think about just the breakdown of the space and uh, how does everything fit together from DAOs to NFTs to DeFi and how this all evolved and where we are today. Um, it's fairly high level. We will not go into what Bitcoin is. Uh, that is an extremely, extremely important foundational thing, but I think we can all assume that there is a fair bit of uh, knowledge about that now in this group. Uh, the second part of this, we will move into what we are doing as Antler and give you a taste of the kinds of companies we've backed across various regions. And the last part will be some of our theses and eight, eight areas of interest uh, both looking at what's near term in 2022, 23, but also uh, taking a little bit of a long-term view. So that's the, and we'll hopefully leave about 15 to 15 odd minutes for, for question and answers. Um, just before we get started, a quick uh, preview of a couple of other announcements. Uh, what we've been up to, we've done 50 new investments since, uh, for those of you who joined our previous Antler Insights across various regions, we're expanding in new regions as an organization. LATAM is coming up more funds in Asia. We launched the global Web3 call, which we will talk a little bit more about in a bit. And we also have two new exciting events uh, next week, one on Web3, the road ahead. We have a conversation with um, folks from Zanpool and Solana and another fireside chat with Rahul Vora, the founder of Superhuman, a, a company I'm sure all of you have heard of. So now let's, let's kick it off. Uh, really to start with the overview of Web3. So you know, how did this all happen? Uh, for a long time, uh, since the since you know, 1970s onwards, there's been sort of a move towards electronic finance, embedded finance, and what's called fintech, right? And then you had 2008 financial crisis, Bitcoin white paper. And for the next several years, the, the, the focus was really on decentralized money, right? <laughs> and then Bitcoin, as, as the adoption took off, uh, the next thing people asked was, well, if you could decentralize money, what else could you do? So could you decentralize other things? Could you decentralize applications in general? And that's where, of course, we got the substrate of Ethereum, which created the idea of smart contracts and self-executing programs. So a lot of applications could be built in a decentralized way. And people started to imagine everything from decentralized Facebook and 
decentralized Uber, etc. Of course, none of that had that happened. A lot of it was hype in 2016, 17. Those of you who were following ICOs might remember. People felt everything could get disrupted, including venture capital. Turns out most of the ICOs, maybe 95 to 99 percent, were, if not scams, fairly useless or fairly unrealistic projects. But that all created this, this base of adoption and awareness, right? And then if you look at what was happening uh, between 2018 onwards, a lot of the activity was really the inception of DeFi, where, where people started to look at finance and say, what is finance today? It's, it's money and payments at the, at the core of it, but really around it, you build layers like banking, investments, lending, insurance, and so on. And so what if you could start to decentralize and, and go with the idea of composability, right? What if you could reimagine the entire financial system and think of each of these use cases as essentially a set of composable primitives where crypto could play a role? And could you create an infrastructure where banks would not be needed at all? So we think that's extremely important. We'll talk a little bit more about it. But that's been the, the crux of most of the activity until sort of 2020, 2021, right? For the last, let's say, 2018 to 2020, most of the focus was on DeFi. And 2020 was the year, I guess, that it really took off. And then we had the pandemic. Too much money in the world, too much liquidity, too much time. And uh, 2021, really, if we have to pick one theme, was really about NFTs. And that was the first instance of something that, you know, what we've been waiting for is something that creates consumer awareness and mass awareness and in an entertaining way. And it just kind of came together. It was a convergence of all this and NFTs took off. What is 2022 about? We think there's going to be a lot more of this, but also uh, some big leaps in areas like DAOs. And we talk a little bit about that later. So this is, the, this is a very quick chronology, right? Now, what does this mean for Web3? What is Web3? And just like Web3 and, and the second term that we hear a lot about is metaverse. Uh, next slide. Uh, what, we, what we really first want to do is share with you how we think about it. So at the highest level, we think that this entire space is two wonderful things happening. There's a new internet and there's a new financial system. Which, what does that mean? Next one. It, it's, it's what we call the new financial system is really what I just explained with DeFi. And the underpinnings of a new internet, everything that's associated with it is Web3. And of course, even DeFi and Web3 will interact a lot. And NFTs is a great example of something that is, is, is decentralized to some extent, but is also uh, an important part of the Web3 experience for a lot of new users. <clears throat> and the idea here is that when I just explained to you the evolution from Bitcoin all the way to DeFi, it's always been about the asset side. Right? So if you look at the next one, it, it's always about the asset side. And the biggest criticism people have had of crypto is all crypto right now is just to buy some other crypto. And that's actually an interesting, fair criticism. And what we've been waiting for is the application side, not just the asset side. The asset side today is getting fairly well developed, but it's the application side, which we generally broadly consider Web3 to be about. And that's what really excites us. And when you, think, when you look at this slide, I don't think there are more things in the world that are more exciting, right? When you look at a completely new financial system, completely new internet. So as Antler, we're really bullish on, on both of these. We've done 20 investments, close to 20 investments now. And we really want to take that number to 100 uh, in the next uh, 18 to 24 months. Next. <laughs> so now, uh, one of the questions always asked is, okay, well, we just talked about Web3 as this new internet, but what what are the building blocks? Like what is the difference between DAOs and NFTs and Web3? How does this all fit together? So from our perspective, the way we think about the evolution is crypto primitives have, have now become understood. And the idea of how a decentralized system can scale has become understood. But for something to be a new internet, you've got three or four more components that have to play out. And this is all work in progress at you know, some of this you've heard of more than others. So in a Web3, uh, the user experience will really begin with self-sovereign identity. It may not be completely self-sovereign, but it will be an identity which is unlike what you experience today. Today's identity is web identity is essentially federated identity. What do we do? We federate and uh, by proxy appoint Google and Facebook to manage our logins to every new environment. Whereas self-sovereign identity will mean you have a, a wallet that's 
completely in your control. The data doesn't leave your wallet without your permission. And perhaps this is one wallet for identity and access to various dApps. So today we have apps. Tomorrow we will have decentralized apps, dApps. So that's the first area where I think uh, a lot of work will need to happen for Web3 to be truly what people uh, hope and imagine it would be. The second part of this is that the web essentially is a stack, right? It says, it's, if you can think about it as a technology stack, there is storage, there are servers somewhere, there's computing power, there is content delivery. Today, all of this is centralized. We depend on AWS, Amazon, Google Drives, Dropbox kinds of players for managing our storage. Uh, AWS, of course, for compute and um, several large CDNs for content delivery. And there are other parts of the infrastructure as well. This will also get decentralized because the idea is that if you're really going to disrupt centralized players, then you should not have um, you know, single points of failure in terms of the infrastructure. So this is another area where there's been talk and, and work being done for a, quite a while with, uh, with things like Definity or Filecoin. And uh, it's still to be seen how well this plays out, but, but, with, but clearly with NFTs, we've seen the adoption of some decentralized infrastructure in terms of storage with uh, platforms like RV. The next piece is DAOs, uh, which I'm sure many of you have heard of, decentralized autonomous organizations. Today, most DAOs are probably neither decentralized nor autonomous, and maybe not even very organized. As someone said, most DAOs today are essentially discord groups um, in some form. But one of the things we are very excited about is better tooling and, and a better user experience for people to organize themselves as DAOs. And the big idea with DAOs, right, it challenges the notion of the corporation itself. Why do you need companies? So just like Bitcoin or DeFi would ask, why do you need banks? DAOs are asking the question, do you need the typical process of company formation and this entire legal structure that we are used to? Or could you actually encode all of that with smart contracts and, and make it trustworthy by folks who don't know each other? Could you make it truly trustless, right? And of course, NFTs is the, is the other part, which all of you have heard of, perhaps a lot of you own a number of them. And, and really the, the, the beautiful part about NFTs is yes, today there is the, the gaming and entertainment and music and art and fractional ownership in interesting assets that you could not buy by yourself, but maybe you could form a DAO and buy them together. This has happened with things like Constitution DAO, where people tried to buy a copy of the US Constitution. Many of you would have heard of pieces of art, digital art being sold for as much as 69 million, the people example. But, but at the heart of it, beyond all the, the awareness and adoption, right? it's a really interesting idea that could assets be truly digital? We are always used to physical assets, right? But could every digital asset be owned uh, in a unique way, whether that's intellectual property? And tomorrow, could these NFTs be tied to real world ownership? So that, that's that's sort of what all of this comes together to form what we call Web three. So you know, it's a buzzword thrown around, and a lot of people criticize it as just a rebranding of crypto, which is fair, but. These pieces, from our perspective, these are the four or five interesting pieces that have to come together for a new internet to be created. Next one. Um, and then there's the idea of metaverse. So some of you might be wondering, okay, well, that's great, but what about this metaverse thing that I keep hearing about? So that's where the entire Web3 that we just went through, when that comes together with other things that are happening in the world, are augmented reality, virtual reality, AI, internet of things, perhaps, um, but in a virtual sense, that's where you imagine a world uh, where lots and lots of people are spending the majority of their day immersed in a, in a virtual environment. That's what the metaverse is. It really is what is beyond the internet. So Web3 is a new internet, but what's beyond the new internet is what I would call metaverse when all of this comes together. Next. <clears throat> and so just to really recap, what would that mean? Because some of some people are throwing around the word, the word metaverse as well. Are we already in a metaverse? Are we spending all this all our days uh, in gaming environments and on Zoom? Is that already metaverse? Well, not really, right? I mean, this is just uh, this is still Web 2.0. The, the things that have to come together beyond Web 3 for what we call the metaverse are three important concepts: digital representations, where your avatars will be in these virtual environments on your behalf. 
Now, this is already happening, especially in gaming. Gaming is a $200 billion industry. It's larger than Hollywood music combined. And of course, we are getting more and more used to it with social media. The idea that we are, you know, our digital representations will go into new environments. And that could mean you get educated in a place, you have a virtual office. Um, and, and lots of teams are already working in, in interesting environments like, like Gather, et cetera, um, to try this out. The next step is actual immersive environments, right? Where usually a device would be involved with AR or VR, just like there's a Moore's law for, super, for uh, semiconductors, there's something called the Wright's law, which basically suggests that by 2030, uh, virtual reality uh, devices will become truly immersive and also affordable at a, at a point that it will be ubiquitous. Today, you can get an Oculus for about $300. That's already affordable for a lot of people. But this complete democratization is coming very fast. And then finally, it's only truly metaverse when you also have virtual economies. So there we go back to the idea of asset ownership, NFTs, open communities, where you can imagine you will be in this environment, sitting in your home, you will be perhaps going to call a college, uh, a virtual university, and you will be buying and selling with tokens in that environment, and it will all be decentralized and, um, and, and ideally, truly a social experience that you can feel a connection to, because a lot, of the a lot of people would point out that all this is great, but how do you create the connection? But we have to remember that a lot of this is going to resonate far more with Gen Zs and alphas who are just coming out of their teens. So that's a little bit about the high level view, which, which hopefully is helpful to, to, for some of you to see how we situate everything and what are the building blocks. Moving on to uh, the, next, the next thing is, <coughs> the next, yeah. So uh, a lot of buzz, of course, OpenSea, this is a proxy for NFT volume. I'll go really quickly through this section. $23 billion of volume last year on one platform. That's how quickly this has grown. So you can see it was absolutely for a long time, there was nothing. And then middle of next year, the NFT boom takes off in a massive way. And OpenSea just is, is now a company worth um, 13 to $15 billion. Similarly, Metaverse, I think uh, many of you have heard it a little too much. Um, next, Marcus, please. <clears throat> the mentions uh, are, are a proxy for, you know, one of the curious things is when traditional companies who are public start to mention you in their press releases and in their earnings announcements. So, it's, it's, it's interesting that uh, uh, yesterday's Microsoft's acquisition of Activision is being now framed as a metaverse purchase. So there's clearly a lot of hype, a lot of buzz. Um, but to be very clear, I don't think that much of what's being talked about today is, is actually metaverse for the reasons that we went through. But this is so exciting that you know, we need to stay ahead of this. <clears throat> so uh, where are we exactly? Right, and that's the question. Okay, it's really hard to tell. Um, so some, this is from a different venture from Venrock. They would, you know, one can say that we started with currencies and tokens and as assets. Then we went to DeFi and then we went to NFTs, and now we'll start to see things which combine NFTs and DeFi. Uh, that's one way to look at it. The uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> the uh, the history I just went through, I think, to just to summarize, you know, when 2008 to 16 was really Bitcoin and first blockchains, early adoption, Ethereum went public in 2014. Then you had this phase where it was frenzy, a lot of capital coming in, ICOs. Uh, Ethereum became uh, much more popular and, and a huge ecosystem for developers. And the killer app for Ethereum was simply that it was a place where you could raise money, right? And of course, this was very speculative. Then you had the winter, as it's called in crypto, and these winters can be very short as we've seen now. Um, but for a couple of years, there was a bear market. And, and as it always happens, some of the more interesting things get started during these crashes. And so that's where you had um, DeFi, uh, people quietly building some very interesting things from Uniswap to Compound and Aave. And then, of course, the last two years, with especially with the impact of COVID, what, do, what have we seen? We've seen institutional money coming into this asset class in a huge way still early days. We've seen DeFi maturing. And as I just went over last year, the consumer awareness of this being driven primarily with NFTs. And now all of this being, being sort of combined with the idea of, of metaverse. But we certainly feel that there is, uh, in certain areas, a little too much hype right now. 
<coughs> moving to the next. And, and this might be interesting to look at. So it's really important to understand where we are. Right now, about 100,000 wallets are in metaverse linked environments. So we're really, really early. About half a million people have NFTs. About one to two million people are playing blockchain-based games. A huge part of this is uh, something called Axie Infinity, which came out of Southeast Asia. About three million people have some level of participation with DeFi. Compare that to about 100 to 200. And of course, for reasons you can appreciate, the estimates are a little bit all over a range, but we're orders of magnitude, you know, about 100x from where blockchain-based gaming is and, and DeFi is to, uh, when you look at the number of people with crypto exposure. Put another way, of all the people in the world who have crypto exposure, we're still talking about maybe 1% of them actually being in, in blockchain-based gaming and a half or lower percent being in NFTs or metaverse. So we're really early in terms of actual usage, but of course, these numbers can grow really quickly, right? But the more important thing is how early we are, even when you look at the, the if you take a step back, right? You've got about 250 million people who follow esports, and of course, almost 3 billion people who are on some Facebook property. So we're still very early, and this is a really exciting time to start building. So we, now we, let's let's actually define a few more things that uh, that we pay attention to with with Web three. And as I went over the the core concepts are that this new web should be open, trustless, permissionless. So the idea that anyone can can hop on, create a quick wallet, and start to participate in 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 these applications, these DApps, right? What today, if you think about it, um, you know you you. For financial applications, you have a KYC and you have an onboarding process, which is fairly painful for most people. And for other apps, you have sort of these silos and wall gardens of Google and Facebook that largely dominate the internet, right? And of course, then you have the idea of censorship resistance, which is another reason that people are very excited about Web3. Uh, maybe Marcus, you want to go through the next parts? Yeah, sure. Thanks, uh, Nitin. So. So also to, to uh, really want to spend a couple of slides to illustrate on uh, on the, the difference uh, between Web 2 and Web 3 in, the, in that context. So, so as you know, right now, the, the Web 2, the internet, as we know, is dominated by the Googles and Facebooks and Amazons of the world. So they own uh, the information, the, the, the hosting, data processing, they're, 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 there is uh, all the social interactions and uh, storage happens there. And uh, they have control uh, over, over which applications get uh, released, uh, how they are listed, uh, how they're ranked, and uh, and also within the payment space, uh, banks, Visa, Mastercard of the world, they're 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 controlling that uh, uh, um, that space with uh, near uh, near monopolies or um, um, uh, as of today. And there is also obviously lots of issues around that. So on on one side, the centralized points of failures, there are outages. There is uh, sometimes censorship done in a, in a, uh, the, by a few. Um, there is there is also some obviously incentives for the for these monopolies to maximize profit. That is not always maximizing the, uh, the, the what, what the participants uh, um, uh, of the network would, would would like to see. And uh, and data is is not always secure. It is not always used in the way the users want to, or or uh, or not always very transparent on how it is. How it is used. So this is probably familiar to all of you guys. So really, to recap on the the points Nitin made earlier, Web two uh, owned by a few uh, like IP is owned and a code is owned by the companies. Web three it open source, so uh, anyone can build and contribute to the code. It's fully transparent. They can reuse, fork the code, build build a better version, and uh, they, um, and contribute to the overall ecosystem to grow. Uh, on the trust side, um, uh, there is also uh, um, um, obviously you trust that these large companies don't misuse the data, or you go to a bank because you trust they will they will uh, keep your your assets safely. Uh, whereas in in uh, in Web three, you don't need to trust uh, anyone. You you need to trust the overall protocol and the consensus mechanism to work, and uh, to um, uh, to to 
there is a, is a, unless there is a 51% attack, there is no way that the blockchain can be, um, it, it can be taken over and, and it is it is very secure in that way. And permission-wise also in the in the web too, and not everyone can participate. Often the barriers to entry are high. You need to go through KYC. You need to go to the bank account to open a, uh, go, go to a bank to open an account and so on. Whereas in Web3, anyone with uh, an internet connection can participate. Censorship we discussed. And, uh, and, and uh, so I'm gonna slightly speed up given the time. Um, um, uh, this is the uh, uh, one way to visualize it. On the left side, you see the value captured in the in the old world or the Web2, where the protocol layer, which which is mainly the, the hosting trans, uh, communication protocol that is very low value capture and most of the value is captured through the application layer with uh, companies like Facebook and Google that own the code user base, uh, so um, um, and data and everything behind it and maximize value for the shareholders. On the right side, you can see the opposite. So value is now captured in the Web3 world, the value is captured on the protocol layer that enables many of the interactions that were previously done in a centralized way to in, in, a, in a bed in, in just to the same extent, if not better, in a decentralized way. So you don't need to trust anyone to make a transaction. Users can control their own data, that they can contribute and easily access it and also participate in the value capture as they will also at the same time can be owners of the protocol such as Ethereum or other blo blockchain layers that 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 you uh, that are out there and then the application layer and the dApps that are built on top that value capture will be that will be much smaller um here um i'm gonna skip given time and and also here uh, just mindful of time um, one thing that is also helpful to, to outline is, is uh, that then the, anyone participating in Web3 protocols and uh, decentralized networks, they can participate, um, they can also get rewarded for their contribution. So you're, I'm sure you're familiar on the left side, the top left, uh, the, the networks you know as of the, the social networks where you can like, message other, share, and you get rewarded for visibility. Uh, social recognition and others, which of course will not disappear, but it can go much beyond that. Uh, so in the future, there will be uh, any contribution in the web uh, can be rewarded through uh, through, through tokens or, or monetary monetary rewards. So 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 anyone who is who is uh, making writing a message helps resolve an issue, contributes the content, contributes the code, or generally helps the ecosystem to grow, is an advocate to the to the network will will get rewarded. It can then also go beyond uh, or um, in, in, into the gaming space, um, which is an extension of it. Uh, many of you have, may have heard of Axie Infinity. It's a play to earn game um, in, uh, founded in 2018 by a Vietnamese team, has in the meantime grown rapid adoption, uh, reached a market cap of 20 billion uh, USD. In, uh, and and it's, it's basically a simple battling and card game where you, in order to join, you have to buy creatures and uh, you can then breed them, grow them, uh, battle with other creatures uh, that are uh, in the form of an NFT. You can also buy land uh, in the form of an NFT and uh, depending on how you perform in the game, you can get rewards and, and monetize and, and grow your both your NFT and, and your tokens over time. So so um, uh, many players have, have in the meantime created a, living out of that and, and have, have made up made a lot of a lot, a lot of uh, revenues by simply participating in the in the game and and giving their attention to axie infinity and and uh, through good gameplay may uh, earned earned a lot um, um in that so i'm moving over to um the next section where we will talk about antler how what do we do in web3 which nitin is going to start i will then talk about the portfolio companies in Web3 and some of the highlights. Great, thanks, Marcus. So we asked ourselves, uh, you know, there's, there's of course an ecosystem of crypto funds and specialized uh, funds getting formed. And of course, everything from pseudo anonymous financing happens today. Um, but you know, we found ourselves in a very interesting position because uh, as, as most of you know, Antler is an extremely global network. We, are, we have physical presence in uh, in 17 different geographies. And one of the things we've seen again and again, working with founders is 
yes, of course, it's decentralized in a virtual sense, but uh, you know, you still are dealing with people, and any founder in Web three uh, is is usually looking for co-founder, users, developers, most importantly, advisors, investors, and they want to take a global view from day one. Right. So the beautiful thing about the space, of course, it you know it doesn't matter if you say I'm the best at doing X in Canada or India or or New Zealand. It doesn't matter, right? You have to take a global view and keep yourself to a global benchmark on day one, which means that uh, the ability to tap into a vast network uh, of of people who can help you with all these needs, founders, users, developers, is is an important uh, advantage that we can bring to founders. We also happen to be fairly decentralized uh, in a uh, in in our own functioning, as many of you know, we are uh, we have local autonomy and decision making is is much faster. We're not uh, a centralized firm based out of any one region. We are also finding that a, an area where founders are particularly interested in working uh, with a platform like Antler is a lot of people are making the transition from Web two to Web three, right? And part of it is skill set, but you start with things like you know solidity or you know, that's essentially not very different from javascript and and then you need to you have a little bit of a further skill set building which usually has to think has you thinking about distributed systems but more importantly things that developers have not had to do in the past um, token design incentives community and this is fairly new for for some founders from web2 at the same time there are a lot of founders who actually come with very important functional experience which has been missing in Web3 or, or the crypto space in general, right? So you've not had a lot of people who've, who've built teams and companies in the past. So while it's a new way of building, the ingredients are still important. And we feel that Antler where we can work best is actually to be the step one for anyone who is making that transition, for example. But that doesn't mean we are not already working with people who are far more crypto native. The, the other uh, thing we found is that as pro a lot of projects want to start with a simple equity structure, um, many don't, and that's a very important. And we are going to make some uh, uh, headway in, into how we manage digital assets in the reg in a regulated fashion, uh, which is in the works. But a lot of companies and founders want to progressively decentralize. Want they want to progressively sort of tokenize in the future. So we've 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 met a number of founders who have gone through our programs and found it helpful to take those three to six months. Uh, create the chemistry with the co-founder, tap into the network to find advisors, create all those pieces, and then tokenize and do a token raise, uh, whether it's a private sale or a public sale. And we've we've had some really interesting examples uh, of, of some pretty quick success uh, and wealth creation, uh, value creation for founders and, and communities and users uh, following that path. We ourselves have, uh, besides Marcus and I, we have a few num other folks in the team who've got crypto experience um, so we've we've actually done something like 15 or so equity investments, token investments before we started Antlers Web3. This is a snapshot beyond uh, myself and Marcus. We have Kathy, who's been a founder in this space. Um, she built a blockchain infra startup. And we've got many other folks who, who've invested uh, for a while now. Moving to, <clears throat> uh, we've also brought together, um, uh, and this is a growing group of uh, really solid advisors and most importantly, founders who've gone through the journey. Um, so some of these uh, are, are ventures that you would have heard of. Many of them are from Southeast Asia, India, but we continue to grow this network uh, and its number is close to about 15 now. Over to you, Marcus. Great. Um, thanks, yeah. So, so this is a, an overview of the current portfolio companies within Web3 across Antler. Globally, so we have grouped them into the four categories you can see here. So on the on the DeFi side, and I'm gonna be just do a very quick description of each. On the DeFi side, you can see Hodlnot. Uh, they're a Singapore-based company offering um, uh, anyone to seamlessly deploy their Web3 assets on the Hodlnot platform and get interest. So it's like a bank account, but for Web3, you can get uh, six plus percent on your Bitcoin. 10 plus percent on, on some of your the USD stable coins, same on Ethereum, and, and they do that by lending out to margin traders on the other side, and uh, have recently also launched a lot of new features and are expanding their platform, have grown to half a billion AUM within a short time after getting the, the Antler investment. Then we, we recently 
invested in a company called Struct Finance. So they are they are building a, a permissionless protocol to enable structured solution and derivatives within the, the Web3 space. So they do that by having building blocks um, such as fixed income and lending products that are then tokenized and enable uh, various um, pr structured products to be built. So initially they offer like fixed yield, uh, less leverage yields, and then also over time customizable solutions they can sell, send, uh, sell to institutions. And through that add a new layer on top of the DeFi, DeFi, um, um, DeFi universe. Then Pecala is a Berlin-based company offering a robo-investment solution for anyone to seamlessly deploy capital and, and participate in a basket of Web3 assets, similar to uh, buying an ETF or, or, or robo-investing in the conventional way, uh, getting the full exposure on the space. Uh, Alpha Impact, a Singapore-based company, they're offering a, a copy trading solution. So, I see probably many of you don't have the time to fully stay on top of the markets and knowing what to buy. So Alpha Impact makes it easy for anyone to, to buy, uh, follow top traders, copy their strategies either manually or integrate APIs to the exchanges and, and through that uh, get an edge. Um, on the NFT side, we have also made quite a few investments. Uh, one, one is Art Wall Street, a Singapore-based company that is offering a um, uh, a SaaS uh, helping brands and creators to seamlessly issue their NFTs and then also se sell them to, to consumers, not, not just the Web3 native ones, but anyone um, uh, to make the whole process much more seamless for both Web2 brands and creators, but also Web2 users to tap into the, the space, issue and, and buy and engage with these users uh, in the NFT space. They're also doing it multi-chain, so they, 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 they're not relying on Ethereum, but they can also tap into Polygon or the protocol without creating lots of gas fees and, and transaction costs. So the, another one uh, is Lloyd. Uh, they're a Oslo-based company um, focusing on the 3D models um, and uh, enabling game developers and creators to build 3D assets in the metaverse. CarbonFi, a Singapore-based company issuing carbon NFTs and uh, also having the vision to, on one side, enable uh, Web3 asset holders to deploy assets and, and get uh, offset their carbon emissions. Um, and on the other side, also building a decentralized carbon uh, offset exchange. Uh, Dropstar, uh, briefly, Berlin-based company is focusing on music NFTs. Uh, then we have uh, Michi, a London-based company that uh, enables uses to more in, uh, immerse uh, themselves in the metaverse and interact with their avatars through AR and VR and uh, also uh, have a digital self and uh, monitor facial expression, eye tracking and uh, see that uh, in, uh, interact with their avatars uh, in real time and over time also build a marketplace for avatars. Uh, Soulmate is, uh, is, is combining NFTs with a play to earn model company out of Stockholm. Then on the, on the metaverse side or play to earn side, um, we have uh, recently invested in a Singapore based company called Defiance that enables anyone to join the play to earn space by giving grants to promising gamers and supports them, educates them to become better at playing games and then over time give a share of the profits back. Uh, we have another one undisclosed investment in the same space in India. And then uh, the, the fourth category uh, is uh, more in the on ramp and uh, Generally, mainstream adoption, usability of crypto, uh, definitely worth pointing out. Example, a Singapore-based company that makes it seamless to on and off port crypto, convert it back to fiat through a network of liquidity providers in both um, crypto fiat and then also across cross-border transactions if a new product called Xampay they recently launched. Honeycoin is a Nairobi-based company that makes it easier to get paid, anyone to get paid and transfer cross-border plus two additional ones we, we have uh, here uh, in, uh, we have in India. Um, these are quickly some of the recent highlights of some of the portfolio companies here, uh, I explained. Xanpool recently raised uh, $27 million from various investors, including Valar Ventures, uh, Peter Thiel's fund, uh, to, to grow, their, grow their decentralized payment network. Then Alpha, the copy trading platform Alpha Impact raised uh, more than $3 million before launching their product. 
Uh, just a few days ago, Carbon Files in Singapore raised 600,000 USD in seed funding to build their carbon offsets for uh, NFTs for ASEAN. And uh, as I mentioned, Hodl not great uh, AUM momentum and Art Wall Street before uh, rolling out their SAS, they quickly launched their own collection and uh, sold uh, their 999 NFTs within a very short time, uh, each costing the three figure range. Um, then uh, another thing that is worth pointing out uh, is that we currently do a call for founders and startups building in Web3. So we wanna uh, get, uh, give them, ex uh, do an extra screening effort to really get top tier founders into our existing Antler programs to ideate and build the next generation of Web3 companies uh, with all the support uh, advisors, designated support and Nitin outlined uh, already got more than like a couple of hundred applications within a few weeks and uh, have gotten a few really interesting partners on board. So on one side, we, we're working uh, with Solana Ventures that are doing per periodic portfolio reviews and also give support, um, a, a distribution support to qualifying teams. We, we, we also work with the Polygon team to, to assess um, opportunities uh, to leverage uh, within our portfolio provide them access to learning resources and how they can scale obviously more efficiently through, through Polygon. Um, we, we have a, 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 also provide our teams with access to Avalanche and uh, Questbook. Questbook is one of the largest Web3 communities globally and uh, helps our teams to then also better de uh, recruit um, developers for their projects. Um, that was it on the Antler overview. So as a next step, We'll yeah, I think just to, about, just, yeah. to sum up, uh, you know, the idea for Antlers, we want to deploy hundreds of millions of dollars uh, in this space in the next few years. Uh, the first goal is to sort of uh, bring in 100 new founders into Web3. That's what the global call that Marcus just went through is about. Uh, we've already invested in close to 20 ventures, including some that are currently in progress. And the core proposition for us is, you know, the earlier, the better. So um, as we just discussed earlier, uh, where we can truly add the most value to founders is, is in two areas, like one, that period before they sort of form the team and, and think about progressive tokenization, decentralization. Um, second, um, if they are trying to build a global team uh, from day one, that's where with this one uh, application, what we are doing is we are sort of coordinating the entire global effort in one place. Um, so that teams don't have to apply to every single different uh, antler fund. Um, and finally, it's very complementary to crypto funds. So what we are uh, seeing now is that, you know, we have the ability to hold crypto assets in certain regulated, uh, in certain geographies where regulation allows. And uh, we are participating alongside um, more crypto native funds as well. So that's a nice uh, synergy that we uh, are beginning to see. Uh, I think just to uh, I, maybe given the time uh, we have, if folks have questions, perhaps you could please start sharing in the chat. We'll try to take as many of them as possible. But before that, let's try to rush through opportunities ahead. Um, so, you know, really quickly, in the in the midterm, let's say the next three to five years, the areas that we are very excited about are beyond sort of the decentralized currencies and market making and digital goods, right? So Bitcoin, Uniswap, NFTs are solved to some extent, but because we go very early, we are far more interested in, in projects which are working on decentralized identity, self-sovereign identity, the insurance problems, um, storage and other infrastructure, and a lot, a DAOs itself, as you can see in the next uh, line, that itself is a very important theme for us. Uh, we believe that today DAOs are not decentralized or autonomous or organized for the most part. You've got lots of issues with counting votes, uh, identity. Uh, you don't know if there is actual decentralization. So governance tools, better infrastructure for voting, uh, experiments around uh, other voting mechanisms, quadratic voting, et cetera, um, and, and more community ownership uh, in a true sense beyond sort of the usual players. These are some interesting areas that we wanna go into with DAOs. Um, on sort of layer one, of course, that's a big debate with what's going on at the new layer ones or, or with Ethereum and layer twos will basically be the default. Uh, we're very uh, curious around interoperability there. Um, and But largely we are sort of bullish on both the Ethereum and Solana ecosystems for different reasons. And clearly they're seeing 
and uh, and of course uh, uh, avalanche and on the on the defi side uh, clearly those are becoming very strong with network effects which will be hard to break uh, and finally as we talked about sort of this this holy grail of of a web3 wallet uh, instead of today's maybe 16 step experience for most people you know this itself is is what we think is a huge huge uh, frontier for uh, for to to break to get a billion people into crypto and um, and so as you all are aware there's some very interesting work going on around uh, newer wallets, user experiences, key management, you know, um, other non-custodial solutions for some of this. So we're uh, certainly very interested for to meet anyone that's working in those areas. But um, why don't we switch to uh, the last part of this is just uh, what's really on the horizon. Uh, Marcus, you want to cover the 2022-23 themes? Yep, thanks, uh, Nitin. Yes, just to quickly wrap up, so so the well, the P4 was more than midterm. This this is what we see as the near term opportunities in the in the coming year so i'll briefly talk about DeFi, nfts and also metaverse play to earn so on the DeFi side uh, as, as you know uh, has, 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 has grown, grown to rapidly to 100 billion um, um currently locked in in staking lots of stable coins have also emerged uh, protocols across lending staking decentralized exchanges um, uh, but but there is still uh, it's still early days and we, we see lots of opportunities on one side to also expect we, we expect to see more adoption from institutional investors that will also tap into the DeFi space and uh, one of our portfolio companies Strux Finance is also uh, looking into that and see how they can help institutional investors to better enter the Web3 space and have a risk like the right risk and reward level um, and offer them a customized solution that way. We also see uh, definitely a lot of uh, opportunities to make DeFi more accessible and as part of the overall theme, making Back 3 more accessible. Many of our portfolio companies work on that, including the ones listed here that I, I explained earlier. Uh, then structured products and derivative, definitely a, a right timing to, to, to build that. Uh, Struct Finance is, is also pioneering that space, making uh, good progress with their, with their product. Uh, we have uh, definitely also opportunities for DeFi brands to, uh, or DeFi protocols to go across chains, uh, so a different layer one chains and be multi-chain in general. Uh, Sushi Swap is an example that are de deployed across various layer one chains, uh, not just Ethereum. And then generally um, more adoptions of stable coins, both pegged to USD or real currencies uh, and also other non pack stable coins that they said be more experimental, such as the Olympus DAO, as, a, as an example. Then on the NFT side, uh, also last year, gotten lots of momentum. Many NFTs have sold in the two-figure million range. OpenSea has, has raised at the two-figure billion valuation and uh, uh, lots of momentum, but also see uh, still see opportunities ahead. So, so on one side, there will be more and more uh, decentralized NFT marketplaces and uh, increased community engagement. So uh, examples are Lux, Rare, and Foundation. So not Antler, it's portfolio companies, but just want to quickly mention that. Then uh, there is also a few more uh, um, projects that enable um, composable um, uh, combining NFT and the, the play to earn space. So partially um, soulmate. Uh, and then in terms of combining, uh, like being cross-chain or 12th Street, we have NFT platforms that also make it uh, easier to, to join uh, to, for, for anyone to distribute NFTs, creators to more seamlessly launch their NFTs and, and uh, engage with their, their users. Uh, we talked about our 12th Street. There's also Sloyd um, within the other side. And then generally more use cases in NFT, not just not just the collectibles, but it can be anything like a drop star focusing on music, carbon fi, and other antler company focusing on new, uh, and carbon offsets, uh, and and generally scalability solutions uh, such as immutable uh, that that makes it generally more scalable to grow and, and build NFT uh, the, the NFT space. Last slide. So we also see wider adoption of of the metaverse and play to earn space. I talked about XC Affinity. Uh, there are a few others that are emerging, have grown to rapid adoption. We will see, uh, we definitely see an opportunity to, to, on one side, have more and better games. On the other side, also 
have an integration with AR and VR and have through that the more immersive and realistic interaction. Uh, so uh, Michi, a London-based sample company, looking into that space. We'll also have a we see more and more solutions that will want to lower anyone to participate in the metaverse and play to earn space, such as our company Defiance that is helping anyone to uh, that is uh, to to get started, get some grants funding to to get started in the play to earn space. Then generally Web two gaming companies turning Web three will definitely happen. Uh, will will uh, will will also mobile play to earn uh, will will come more and more, and then. Uh, then integrating yeah, NFTs and play to earn, like having more hybrid setup combining but, uh, the different Web3 elements, uh, such as like Soulmate, Soulmate combining NFTs and, and play to earn. And then, uh, yeah, I, th I think that that should cover enough for now. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and uh, uh, suggest we move forward to the QA. Thanks, thanks, Marcus. Marcus. Hi, Nathan. Uh May I ask a question? Uh, sure. I or if you, if you have, have you already typed it out? I haven't. Okay. I if you don't mind, would you do that in the same order? So we could just go down the list. Fair enough. Uh, we'll do. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Uh, guys, we'll try to, we'll try to cover as much as possible. Uh, we could probably stay a few minutes over, but we want to be respectful of everyone's time. Is there a standard deal for uh, web three startups? It's a good question. At this point, uh, what we are doing is uh, is each diff each fund is looking at it, and so if you're a founder who's joining a program for Antler, um, that is going to be subject to this construct that exists in in that geography. Um, there may be uh, cases when the funds can invest directly in a project, and then the standard deal would not apply. Uh, and finally, a lot of you must be curious about the question of equity versus digital assets. At this point, uh, a few Antler funds are able to hold digital assets. Um, but as I mentioned, sometime later this year, uh, mid this year, in a few months, hopefully, uh, we are able to have an um, Antler wide uh, a way of investing directly in projects that want to issue digital assets. Um, so that's something that's a little bit WIP. But the quick answer is no, it's not a standard deal. Uh, it, it, but but it's a standard deal if you're going through the, the structured uh, co-founder matching programs. Um, what do you think will be the response of Web2 players like FP Google? It's a longer conversation. Uh, Marcus, please jump in if you have uh, if you have comments. But while we're seeing this with, with, with uh, you know, Facebook, of course, everything from rebranding itself to Meta to um, putting in $10 billion um, to whether you consider tomorrow, yesterday's announcement with Microsoft and Activision, um, I think this is extremely disruptive and uh, it will be a mix of, uh, of, of sort of a lot of inorganic uh, activity for them to cr create new brands and reposition themselves as a company that's, um, if not truly decentralized, semi-decentralized. If you remember, Facebook had tried to issue its, uh, its semi-decentralized currency as well a couple of, uh, couple of years ago. And finally, let's remember that... Uh, you know, even in Web3, while we talk about decentralization, parts of Web3 are still going to be decentralized. Uh, so for example, uh, there's a good point that, uh, a good article that came out about Infura and other API players, right? So if you are using your wallet, even if that's truly a self-sovereign digital wallet, uh, but you're actually not a node on the blockchain, you're pinging various uh, API layers like Infura, then that means there is centralized power in those places, right? So I imagine that Google and Facebook will try to play in some of those infrastructure areas as well, um, but much longer conversation. Um, Definitely. And uh, also there is a few examples like Coinbase in a way is centralized, but also very tapped into the Web3 decentralized space. So there is definitely gonna be a lot of hybrid setups and uh, Google, Facebooks and others, they will have to reinvent themselves over the coming 10 years and will probably Will really emerge uh, and uh, um, will will uh, will will uh, uh, they probably also don't know exactly how how to respond, but we're now just observing and engaging early. Uh, to to the next question, uh, maybe I can answer that. Uh, so the best time to engage with Antler is is as early as possible. So so our positioning is we are global early stage VC, but we also have a unique proposition to run our Antler program survey. So we, we, we get top tier founders into the program and help them to get started from the very beginning. So we, we help them find a co-founder, ideate, find the right idea to build, 
push them to do validation and then uh, invest at the earliest possible. So there is no one that's earlier as Antler uh, out there. Uh, at the same time, we are also open to to look at existing teams. We can also enter at at a, at, at, at a slightly later stage. So 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 really, if you're if you're still uh, uh, looking for a co-founder, you you wanna refine your idea or you're really early, then you, you should join our program. But if you're a bit more advanced or you have traction um, and, uh, and ready to raise uh, institutional rounds, then then we can also look at it from an external external point of view. So, so if you're not sure, just reach out to us. We'll be happy to, 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 to take a look. Then what happens, uh, uh, what happens uh, if I'm already in an Antler program, would you have access to the same as the Antler Web3 program? So, uh, uh, I, actually, I actually answered that, uh, Marcus. Yeah. Uh, I have answered that in the text. Okay, great. Um, uh, so, which question are we at now? Sorry, I, I lost. Uh, yeah, we're uh, sort of, uh, sorry, um, I think we didn't cover Vioma. Uh, advice for people in Gen Z um, coming out of their teenage years. How should you start off? Well, um, we, I, I think the best thing is just to tinker and uh, start to play with this, uh, with these, with, with these uh, new tools and new frameworks. Um, in fact, you're better off if you are coming out of your teenage years as Gen Zs. You're far more um, adaptable to this than a lot of people who are later. So you have an edge. And uh, I would say the second thing is just join as many quality communities. There are a lot of communities, but there's a lot of noise. So. Um, you know, you should start to follow and follow your intuition around where the signal to noise ratio is, is uh, a high. Um, sort of, uh, Marcus, you can jump in here, but it's a great question, sort of, and I don't think either of us is a domain expert on um, standards for web one versus web three, but I would just say that it's, um, it's interesting because the, the foundational thinking is that what web one did not enable is for developers to generate any value for themselves, right? Um, and so there was no, while these standards were open, no one created value wealth for themselves if they were behind W3C or ICANN. And uh, arguably, I know this is a lot of, this is debatable, but arguably you have the first instance of uh, developer time and effort being monetized right away. And, and that cannot happen unless you have some uh, for-profit platforms and, and or frameworks or communities that enable that, right? So as much as we would want everything to be nonprofit or decentralized, the reality is that for the foreseeable future, five, 10 years, Web 3.0, I think will always also be at best semi-decentralized. Um, but again, a longer conversation yeah. is, is, um, uh, is valid. And if it, if it gets too, too centralized, then a different protocol, a different network it will emerge because the users will pay attention elsewhere. They will migrate. So, so it also, it can't get too centralized um, given that this is a very fluid, fast moving space and uh, it would just lead to adoption of, of different protocols. So it's, it's also about finding a balance in terms of obviously rewarding early adopters, the users, um, and, and then, then, then at the same time ensuring that participation is worthwhile for, 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 for everyone. Great, um, let's try to see a couple, I, I know we're over time, so uh, if anyone needs to drop off, uh, thank you so much for joining us, um, but we'll continue for a few more minutes if that's okay, Marcus. Yeah, I'll see you on as well. Um, Thanks everyone. What's, what's, what's next, uh, let's see. Um, Bradley, how do governments tax and regulate revenue producing activity? Again, very hard to answer this. Uh, I would say the short of it is they don't know. They don't know today. I don't think any government has figured out. Uh, I'm assuming you're talking about everything related to Web3, specifically in crypto instruments. Um, I don't know of any government that's figured out how these things should be understood. So. Um, as you know, from a regulatory learning perspective, uh, most governments are of maybe one or two, three years behind where the ecosystem is. And uh, so we'll just have to wait. It's also not something that uh, we are probably best placed to answer. Um, yeah, Metaverse, then on the, yeah. Then the next one uh, on, on the how Web3 and Metaverse will, will affect healthcare and, and use virtual avatars to offer new form of treatments. I think this is definitely 
uh, an interesting question. Um, uh, uh, one side, uh, we see lots of opportunities to build, uh, obviously, startup within the metaverse, right? So you could build a healthcare solutions for for your avatars or for 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 um, which is potentially a bit too far fetched, but but still, anything that works in the real world. Uh, potentially can be applied as, as an opportunity in the metaverse once it is mature enough. Maybe it's a bit early right now. On the other side, there is there is, a, there is also um, uh, ways to, to potentially leverage IP and healthcare or access uh, in the form of an NFT. Um, but, but but that one, I I think it's quite a difficult question to answer. And uh, I would I would uh, question is more of a timing when is the right time to engage. But but. Uh, probably a longer discussion to have. Would love to, to chat more about it at the later point. Yeah, guys, and obviously, we, we, you know, we're only scratching the surface. If you want to have uh, a longer discussion, um, our emails are nitin at antler.co, marcus at antler.co. So um, for those of you who are building something, we'd love to continue the conversation. Uh, maybe take one or two last ones. Um, marcus, you want to take one yeah. and I'll take so one? No, sure. So, so the next question on the investment DAOs as a new model for VC investing. So there have been a few attempts out there. Um, it is uh, certainly interesting that the, 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 the problem is, is still decision making in a DAO is still at a very early stage. So, so governance is still experimental. We still need to, to ensure obviously solid investment decisions are made and, and not everyone might necessarily know what's the best a uh, best form to uh, decision to uh, de decisions to make. So, so I would say um, it, it definitely an interesting model for VC investing. A bit too early to to, to point out uh, success stories. I think there was BitDAO or a few other attempts. I think that are doing relatively well. Um, um, but then, how the decision making and tokenomics that that I, I would say still, uh, as Nitin also points out in the presentation, the whole DAO DAOs are a mega mega theme. It will emerge. There will be a few DAOs that will be huge 2025, 20, 2030, 20, but that it is still very experimental at this stage. I'm experimenting in the, the space myself, so I'll share experience when I advance it a bit more. Thanks, Thank uh, Lena. Great. Um, I think uh, uh, we'll take one more. Uh, sort of your question uh, do, do Companies that, that use blockchain for a particular use case and are regulated. Yes, uh, we are. We understand that, as, as I've said a couple of times, while the idea is around decentralization, a lot of things are actually centralized and will continue to be semi-centralized, decentralized at best. So including things which are custody and, and have to, or things like what, you know, software that helps institutions come into the space, uh, software that helps governments look at the activity, compliance, uh, accounting, some of the boring things are actually very interesting to us. So at the end of the day, we're looking at picks and shovels that help grow this economy from a few million people to billions of people. So anything that brings capital in, talent in, users in, is something we would look at. Um, I think last thing on um, Metaverse Web3 around climate change, also very long conversation. Um, I will share my two cents. I think uh, this is self-correcting to some extent. There's every time you have the debate around how much energy Bitcoin con consumes and you have some good arguments. And of course, there's a lot of scalability uh, upgrades that are also happening. And um, you know some of the new L1s uh, would arguably be more energy efficient. And um, and NFTs, of course, uh, create an interesting challenge with, with that as well. But I, I think we'll just see a self-correcting mechanism because um, uh, th there is going to be a factoring in of, of climate costs as well. And you're seeing that. You're also seeing some interesting things which are positive. So Climate DAO, for example, uh, is a DAO that's uh, bought something like 17 million carbon credits. So you know, you're going to probably see these types of things as offsets. So projects might end up uh, buying, you know, buying into climate DAO or something, perhaps to to offset their footprint. <clears throat> I think uh, thanks, guys. I think we're at uh, ten minutes over almost. So thank you so much. Uh, sorry if we uh, didn't get into everything that you wanted to, but um, we will try to share the recording. 
And uh, thanks so much. We're really excited to hear from um, all of you in the future. Thanks a lot, Al, for joining. <clears throat>